Hi, this is Robin Cassidy and Allison Polevsky with Creativity Deconstructed, a podcast where we interview artists, disruptors, and entrepreneurs and uncover the secrets behind how these creators turn their ingenuity into profitability. Today is Friday, May 29th, and we are in Venice, California at the spectacularly modern home of one of the world's most prized architects. To mark time, it's worth noting that we are just beginning to reopen the city as we emerge from the COVID-19 global pandemic. Masks have become the new normal and social distancing is as relevant as social media. Los Angeles is inhabited by the famous, whether it be actors, business moguls, reporters, or athletes, none of whom leave me particularly starstruck as they are simply part of our daily life. However, as a passionate architect lover, today's star architect, Kulapat Yantrasas, accomplish equally impress and fascinate me. Kulapat founded Y Architecture in 2003, and just a few short years later, completed the Grand Rapids Art Museum in Michigan, which was the first art museum building in the world to receive the LEED Gold Certification for Environmentally Sustainable Design. He's gone on to become the go-to architect for art and design spaces, completing projects for the American Museum of Natural History in New York, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, not to mention literally helping to shape Los Angeles, having worked on the Marciano Art Foundation, David Kordansky Gallery, ICAL. LA, ICA LA, and Christie's Beverly Hills flagship, to name just a few. Your list of accomplishments really does go on and on, but we have to get to the guts before we get to the glory. I know that you were born in Bangkok, Thailand, and that your father was an engineer, and you eventually went on to receive your Master's of Architecture from the University of Tokyo before spending eight years working for Tadao Ando. And can you, we would love for you to talk about your journey from childhood into young adulthood and the early years of what really drove your interest into art, architecture, and design, if you would. Well, thank you, Alison. So, you know, growing up in Thailand, I think my parents, middle class, right? They're very, uh, they do everything they could to support our education, uh, trying to get us to expose to traveling, to uh, good influence. My mother uh, was a librarian, so we have a lot of books at home. I go to book fairs with her and really love the joy of, of reading, even when I was younger. And I think, uh, you know, as, as frugal as they were, they felt it was important to take children, myself and, and my sister, to Europe every, every summer. Just, you know, just to kind of visiting relatives and just to kind of expose that. So I was so blown away by how, you know, I was maybe not going to architecture itself as cities, like seeing Paris for the first time, I remember when I was seven, which is so majestic, but also so overwhelming. You know, you don't really know as, as a child, you know, at the time, not that Bangkok is not beautiful, but it's so different, right? So that love of city and something that can be so pleasure, uh, pleasant and beautiful, is actually man-made. I was mm -hmm. so struck by that mm -hmm. notion. But at the same time, when it was around nine, uh, we have a, a, a kind of a renovation of the house. And so that's the summer we didn't go anywhere. And my father, being an engineer, was quite smart. So because I was restless, I was like, what do we do? I don't go to camp, I don't do anything. And my father said, well, why don't you just hang around the, uh, the workers, the construction workers, and if they just clean up the trash and pick up the nails, and you can sell the nails back to me. Right, so I was kind of hanging out with the workers, helping them, handing the tools and pick up the nails and, you know, but for hope that I can get some, some change at the end of the day to buy ice cream. And by through that, I started to really appreciate the work that they were doing together, how things are put together. And my father was also very smart also, you know, even though, you know, uh, when I was young, I didn't think so at all. Um, because, you know, uh, he was engaging me in a, in, in, in a conversation, you know, like my, my room has to be expanded for some reason. He think, well, what do you think? Would you want it to be a bigger room uh, uh, with no balcony? Or do you want a balcony? How do you want your room to be, the windows? Mm. So for a nine year old, I was like, what? Like, you ha I have the right to do all of these things, mm. right? And I remember that, that that was just such a, like, why are you asking me this? Like, I'm supposed to just live where you want me to, right? But the idea that he asked how I want to spend time in my own room, 
was kind of maybe the first question that think that, oh, I could shape my own environment. Mm. So that kind of lead on to the interest. And as I go into uh, high school, I was such a good student uh, that, uh, you know, in my class of 50, uh, majority are doctors, right? So being a, a good student in Asia, then you are like a doctor, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? So, and then I was, I was fighting that, even though it was kind of soft pressure from the parents to like, well, that's what, you know, respectable profession, we, we need a doctor in the family and stuff like that. And I start to feel like, well, I, I don't see myself that way. I don't see myself in white gown, you know, talking about internships and residents and things like that. And so, you know, then I, I, I then 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 I talked to to my father and said, well, I don't think I want to be a doctor. I think I want to do design. Mm. I don't know what that is How at the that time. Right? I was very uh, graphic when I was growing up. I love graphic design. I love interior design. I love fashion. I love anything design. You know, I don't really know which channel design that I can kind of go in. So I felt architecture is kind of like a like a mother of all. It's like a like a, a good training ground, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get in there. It's also a respectable profession, you know. I mean people Almost feel mathematical. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I like, you know, I mean you know, deep down sometimes I think, well, if I said I want to be an artist, would I be able to do it? Mm. But at the time, you know, architecture seemed to be like the right balance. Enough creativity, but have a background of technical, which is what I study, and then, you know, the business aspect it's socially Accept it as a you know legitimate uh, son-in-law mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> profession. <laughs> true, very true. Yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. it's kind of that kind of combination. Mm -hmm. But one last thing, you know, in, in, interesting. Uh, my 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 father at that time told me like, yeah. Well, he turned around and 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 and, 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 and told my mother and said, well, you know, we have enough money now that even though he doesn't make anything, that he can still support himself. So why wouldn't we not want him just do what he wanted, right? What a great then, answer from your father. So yeah. in the end, he was really encouraging of the creative decision. Yeah, I think he, you know, I think parents really love their kids to be happy, mm -hmm. right? And success is part of happiness, I guess. But in this case, because, you know, I he knew that I was, in a way, struggling with that decision. Like, you know, yes, I would like to make my family proud with my career, but is that really my career path? Mm -hmm. And then he turned, or after he convinced my mother for me, he turned around and asked me and told me, he's like, well, you have to remember one thing, right? You will never be rich being an architect. You know, like, you know. <laughs> I would comparing. like to know what he has to say <laughs> yeah, now. <laughs> well, because you're selling your time, right? You're selling your service. You know, the margin is not high, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you're choosing this for the love of it. So do not work on anything that you don't want to, you know, just because of money. Mm -hmm. Because if you do so, you're not going to get the money and you're not going to get a happiness. You're going to be in double hell. <laughs> These are such good philosophies so from your father. At, at the time, when I listened to that, I was like, wow. You know, I mean, of course, my, 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 my father was traveling a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So every time he came back, he would want to preach about something. So this is one of those mm -hmm. moments like, oh, my God, another one of those. right? <laughs> but it came back to me surprisingly because at the time I was like, well, at least he supported me. And mm -hmm. anyway, so that's yeah. how I started my, my education in architecture. But he did two things that are interesting. He asked you about how you wanted to shape your environment, which was instrumental setting the tone for the future. And then, you know, he encouraged you to not follow the money. And I think that's such a hard thing to do even in today's world for young people, where they don't just want to pick a career where, it, you're right, in the old days it was doctor, lawyer. But to not follow the money, we've found that most people that had tremendous success say they didn't follow the money, they followed the passion. Because if you love it, the money will follow. follow I think you. so. I think money should always be in the rear mirror, mm -hmm. right? It always you always have to think about it. You know, I think, but at least you're making decision with consciousness of investment, right? Yes. I mean, if you don't think about it at all, it come back and bite you. It yeah. could, right? So I think somehow, but you should not let it be uh, the main factor for how you make decision mm -hmm. or how you make design. You know, like. In my design, I think about budget all the time. You know, I, I don't design without thinking. And sometimes I'm completely surprised that my staff do not think about money. Mm. And because you have clients and they have a budget, usually, correct? Yeah, but it's also intelligence. Yes. Right? Like, yes, of course, if you have 
you know, unlimited amount of money. Anyone can can cook a good meal, mm. right? But if you have a budget, you know, as I think I always think of budget as water. As long as you're above water, you're good. You can do anything you want. But if you're underwater, then you're you know kind of in misery, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So as long as you have a decent, you know, handsome budget, you can do a lot with it. But it doesn't mean that the more the better above that, because mm-hmm. then it will be come, come its own problem. And a lot of the materials that you probably work in are driven by the budget. I mean, there are certain things that are just going to cost more than others. And you're absolutely right that anyone with with no budget, you can do anything. And editing is kind of what brings it back, what makes the Mm. project great. Absolutely. Because, you know, I think investment itself is not creative, right? I mean, it's, it's it's a feel for creativity. So to burn the fuel just for the sake of going is not getting anywhere. Mm-hmm. I think if you have enough fuel and then you can f- choose your destination, this is where you want to land, I think it's important. You know, Ian Pei, uh, who was an amazing architect, right? He always talked about how he, in a way, regretted because he started working as architect for developers in New York before he became in a way, a Pritzker Prize winning architect and things, but he felt like there's decades that he was working for developers that people were not seeing that work as like architecture is capital A. Mm. But when you look at his building, he know how to use money. He know how right. to use money. Like you go and he know where to, like for example, the staircase is always a big chunk of stone, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the corner of the building is always a solid piece of stone, not a mitre. So that not all the architects and designers, normal people, go to this place and they they kind of go and like, oh my God, look at this, right? Mm -hmm. But that's where he knows, you know, working with budget and and how to use it. I think it's the same with cooking. Once you have the good ingredient, you know how to show it off, right? Mm -hmm. And you can balance your budget based on that. It doesn't mean that the more expensive meal is a better meal all the time. It's not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are finally learning that lesson, particularly here in Los Angeles, because street food and the lower end food has made like an incredible appearance all over Los Angeles. And you are really passionate about food. Absolutely. I, I, for me, for some reason, food and maybe also fashion are my two kind of sibling art inspiration, right? Mm-hmm. I look to, to food and fashion almost more than architecture because mm, I because mm-hmm. I think that architecture, you know, how many projects you work in your lifetime, and and my pa- my my father again said that like you know, if you're lucky, maybe you build fifty homes in your lifetime, right? And then you know you want these to be your 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 babies, your, mm-hmm. your masterpiece. But you know, people the chef are, they're cooking air three days a week. I mean, three days three three meals a day. They think about food all the time. They their cycle of experimenting is so fast. Mm-hmm. They're so in touch with people. They're so in touch, touch with all kind of ideas. Fashion, the same thing. And I feel like even though the art form are not exactly the same, the speed that you can see people testing things quicker, mm-hmm. you can actually learn a lot from them. And they both are very in touch with people. They think about people look and feel, you know, how people are thinking today, how they're thinking further. Yeah. Well, the creative director of Gucci, Alessandro Michele, just announced that they're no, they're going away from seasonal fashion. They're going to do two runway shows a year and not be as much like a slave to the seasons. I mean, what do you, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's a COVID I, I'm result? I'm amazed. You know, fashion industries are the hardest working people I've never met. Mm. Like, they're just so the tireless. Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of them just completely burn out. I mean, it's impossible, especially now, you know, and I think it's, I think it's about time that that model got deconstructed, right? Because the whole seasons issue, the whole buyer system, you know, and then of course, you know, Zara come along and then right. everything was now right. Zara. So that they learned that lesson painfully. And by the time you get it, it's over. Yeah. 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 So I, but it, it's, a, it's a, but it's a, so difficult because how you compete with fast fashion, right? I think so. It's a, it's a big soul searching uh, for, for them, but it's for other things, for furniture too, right? How do we create, you know, when you look at Salone, you know, I think this year because it has to cancel, do we miss any kind of earth shattering creativity that we have to have? Like, it's a kind of a interesting thing that once we slow down, you know, I think 
maybe creativity just find its own way in different channel like water right when it's before it was rushing out like almost like out of a pipe now it just kind of osmosis and kind of flow a little bit slower but it's still there because you just wrote an article about creativity during quarantine right absolutely so, absolutely yes does it thrive what happens to it in a situation like we're in right now i think it's you know definitely you know i really believe that in you know necessity is the mother of invention Right? And there's no time like now that need the reinvention, redefining of anything, mm -hmm. redefining of homes, office, hotel, restaurant, you name it, right? Cities, right? So this is the time that we all have to be creative and creative thinkers have to be even more busy to think about how we can really project new ideas, new sense of life for people because people are so getting nervous, like what is the future? Right. So I think as creative individuals, you know, we have we don't have to predict the future, but we can say that we can react. We can think of a different ways. You know, we might not have museum in a way it used to be. We might not have school in a way that it used to be, but it can be even better. Well, you often talk about the nimbleness of architecture. So I think that dovetails into what you're saying in this particular moment in time. But I do like how you speak about like with museums, you often talk about changing spaces and opening later. Can you speak to that a little bit? What, what do you mean by the nimbleness of architecture? I think um, architecture, you know, function on different levels, right? First of all, it's a landmark, it's an icon for the city. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the power that maybe other arts do not really have because it's permanent. It's supposed to be there forever mm -hmm. after you are gone. And so that's why, that's why it has this rigid, quality that it is stability right but at the same time architecture also is activity is experiences is life made in architecture and that part i think architects maybe haven't been in touch as, as much so i like the idea that we think about i always think about it as hardware and software right the hardware mm -hmm. is you know just like your phone or your ipad mm -hmm. it's beautiful it's timeless right but the software has to be updatable you know, yeah. and if you design the hardware that the enough. software mm -hmm. is not updatable, right. it's obsolete. No matter how beautiful the hardware is, we, we all imagine all the computers we have that just could not work anymore because it's not upgradable to the software we want to use today. The same thing in architecture. Uh, you can have a building that's made a thousand years ago, but if it's nimble enough to accommodate new mm -hmm. software, which is new experiences, mm -hmm. then it continues to thrive. But if it, you have an architecture that's made 50 years ago, but it's not open to any kind of upgrade, then you're stuck with it. And sometimes you have to demolish it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a way of surviving in general. So architecture as an urban form also need to survive. And right. the way it survives is that it has to be relevant to human's life. It doesn't have to be spineless in the sense that you can be everything for everyone, but it has to be adaptable and understandable to people that have different way of life today. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about when you've designed for exhibitions that might be temporary or have a finite end to them. Like you just did Freeze LA. I saw an incredible uh, installation and design that you did at LACMA for Japanese samurai and it kind of was like a going, walking through it was like experiencing a march. There was like a cadence. And I'm wondering what you think about and how you approach something that's permanent versus something that's temporary and, and what your design approach is for those. Thank you. Yeah, I think when it comes to, we work a lot in museums, right? And I think we do exactly, I mean, your, your, your point is very, very close to my heart, you know. Uh, an exhibition and a permanent installation are completely two different things, in my opinion. Uh, for the visitors, they might be similar. Mm -hmm. right? uh, for example, like uh, on, on the permanent level, you know, we uh, a, a big renovation of the uh, Rockefeller Wing at the Met now, and that is permanent. Yes. But mm -hmm. it's permanent with modular spaces that can be changed. So maybe 80% of the time, there are, you know, kind of more or less the collection, but there are pieces that allow things to move. And people use museum for that, right? I mean, you, 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 you know, that wing, which is the arts of America, Oceania and America, has been maybe the most uh, visited places of the Med for artists. 
they go back and look at you know the the gong figures you know all of the are uh, kind of you know kind of vernacular artwork right so it's a destination for repeated visits and it's a it's a site of inspiration for an exhibition like what you mentioned the samurai show at lakma you know for me i feel uh, the, the exhibitions normally run between three months or five months depending on institutions but it has to do with almost like an introduction it has an event uh, moment to it mm. a lot of people don't understand the work, right? Maybe a lot of times people will come across samurai artwork for the first time. So the context is very important. And I do feel that in that case, you know, it needs to have a sense of discovery. You know, not that you don't need it in the permanent installation of a museum, you do have that too. But uh, with an exhibition, there's always a narrative, there's a theme. The storytelling is so strong. So you need to have a sense of discovery, like, oh, wow, like what you say, mm -hmm. you come across not only just a samurai costume, it's as if they're going to war, right? Because these are war costumes, even though they're ceremonial, they're, they're there for a reason. And they're beautiful. Yeah. And you have to show both. Exactly. Like the violence and the beauty. Exactly. So and what they were used for. Yeah. So, so I think the art is in it, right? But art is also has context. So, you know, it's always a fight, like, do you celebrate crime? context for the same narrative by lessen the power of art or you only just emphasize the power of art and let it speak to itself without talking about context mm -hmm. so museum is always struggling with that too much context can make art feel like an illustration in a textbook right? without Less getting what it, it makes sense but then i think about freeze and what i experience like walking through freeze i often feel lost and I have this feeling, I go to a lot of art fairs. I've seen you at a lot of art fairs all over the world. <laughs> and um, we all get, we all have the moment in the fair where we're like, oh, did I see everything? Did I go down that row? So when you were thinking about that, because I did have the, it's sort of nice to get lost in those moments. So you're not so aware of covering a grid. But do you think about that when you're thinking about like free is like, where does Gagosian go and where does so-and-so go and how do I create a space where you don't feel like it's up, down, back, forth? How, how do you create that experience? What's your, what's in your head when you're thinking about that? Because it's really just walls that you're putting up. Yeah, exactly. And it's a tent, right? I mean, one thing about freeze is that it's always in a tent mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time with natural light. So that's already kind of good. I think for me, fundamentally for art spaces, it has to work for art, it has to work with people, you know, and we all understand because we all animal that adjust to our environment. When you're in a beautiful room, you feel beautiful, you mm. feel comfortable, right? Because the I'm lighting- I'm feeling pretty is, good right now, <laughs> I love this room. The, 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 mm. the, the light is right, right? And the ideas, so once you feel confident and, 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 and comfortable, then you can explore. You can look at art, you can so you're be safe in a way. You're safe. You know, we all have that, but but if you're kind of in this funny feng shui space, you don't really see what's behind you or whatever. People mm -hmm. don't have that kind of sense of stability to explore, right? To to venture. I think that's important in museums. So you know, it's a mundane, but this good space I talked about is something that makes you feel so home at home mm -hmm. and then then you can venture out mm -hmm. but back to your questions about freeze you know i have no role in placing the, the galleries mm -hmm. and where they are that's a victoria and bettina and mm -hmm. the team but for me it's more about I mean, how do i create an uh, environment that even though it is a commercial space it's an art fair right how do i make it feel that it's not about buying and selling or intimidating. Mm. Yeah, it, it make it more welcoming. It, I want art to be seen. One thing that we did at Freeze with, uh, it's actually the, old, the only time that it happened in an art fair, actually, uh, Matthew and Amanda are really, I love the idea, is that you might not notice, but when you come into the, in, in the tent, right, uh, the corridor or uh, the walkway of, 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 of the, uh, in between the booth, it's actually wider in the front, around 30 feet, and it taper around 20 or 18 mm. in back. So you have this reverse perspective. Oh, so it feel, yeah. it feel, it's very that. subtle. And, mm -hmm. but it of course make such a nightmare to the booth planning because like, <laughs> they're the all booth, like, like yeah. but, but a day they went for it. I, mm -hmm. I felt like, because you know, like what you said, we've been to art fairs all the time and you look, al look along this long corridor. Mm -hmm. It's like, 
like, oh God, it's like a trade show. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't want to go there. But by making the front wider, 30 feet is quite wide for, mm -hmm. for and then you already feel like, oh, it's, it's kind of, I can see, not only that, the galleries in the back are happy because you can kind of pan it out, right? They can, they can see the art even deeper. Right. And then you have, you can see the signage. Yeah, right? exactly. Also, and then, and peek then, out. Yeah, and, and then the galleries mm -hmm. kind of put their art kind of out to the, to yeah. the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see a glimpse of almost like oh, a little so cool. thing. And then as you walked, and then when you arrive, you know, as they say in architecture, arrival is 50% of the work. Yeah. Right. So when you arrive, you don't feel, oh my God, mm -hmm. another aisle, right? So you feel like, oh, there's something nice about this, but you don't mm -hmm. really know. But it was in that area. And again, it's just a logistic because people are kissing at the beginning <laughs> of the space. <laughs> Wait, right. So you need to ago. create the yeah. space for people to greet and not blocking traffic and things like yeah. that. So that's a kind of a subtle thing, but mm -hmm. you never see it because it's so subtle in the work, but mm -hmm. it makes people feel good and it makes uh, the galleries in the back feel like, oh, we were so visible. And, you know, they, and it's, I mean, and Amanda said, well, uh, this is the first time in art fair history that such a thing acts exist. <laughs> I mean, it just seems so brilliant. And I, I, I love this, I, the way you're explaining it now. And we, I was there and I did not notice. Which is powerful. It really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's like a secret ingredient in food, mm -hmm. right? Like it's yes. in there, it tastes good, but it's not trying to scream like, look at me, look at me, look yeah. how good is right. it, right? Yeah, it's kind of that, which I like a lot because I feel that, you know, and in your work to Alison, there's the subtlety of things, bringing things together mm -hmm. and make it feel like there's not a real dogma that's like, well, this is this, right? And mm -hmm. architects love dogma. So we tend to control, we mm -hmm. like to control. And dogma is a good way of controlling because it's a philosophy. So therefore, it's a good reason to control something. Yes. But yeah. wait, you have to, ask, we have to ask, have you ever used that power to make someone uncomfortable for any particular reason? Ooh. Like in a meeting, yes. if you want them to do something, because it is wow. a power. I know. Like, I'm like, how would you build something? That, oh, that's so interesting. I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't, I would, I'm not sure whether it's uncomfortable, but on the opposite end of it, I like tension, mm. right? I mm. like tension, like in a tea ceremony room tension. Like yes. people are tense because especially now people are not very uh, comfortable with silence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. In the moment, yes. there's a mm -hmm. one to one. There's a tension. You can feel that, which I learned a lot from Zen culture in Japan, from the tea ceremony. It's about being quiet. You know, it's mm -hmm. I, I think moment like that I make too, because I want people to be with themselves. Maybe less so now because, you know, the COVID has made us be with ourselves. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I, I do feel that the moment there are outward and the moment that are inward. So the moment of the outward you know, in an art fair, in a museum, in a public building, or in your house, it's good to make people feel comfortable and confident so that they are willing to venture out. They, they want to love something else. But at their moment when you want them to also focus back in, and that's when, you know, I think whether it's a, a spiritual space or, you know, some kind of space, I like, I mean, maybe it's my influence from Ando, I like tension. Uh, in, in, in space. His space is full of tension, amazing, you know, to the point that sometimes as a type person, I felt like it's too controlling. It, it depends on, on context, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah sorry, yeah. do you want to, can we go back, because that is the beginning, you spent eight years working with him, yeah. for him. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how it informed who you became as an architect? Well, it's absolutely the biggest part of my career. You know, mm -hmm. he's my mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a very imp important influence in my life. Uh, I uh, graduated, you know, master's PhD in architecture. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time, you know, reading, working, thinking of architecture uh, before, and it came uh, upon him by accident. We, he was invited to do a talk in Thailand. I was invited to join him for a dinner and become very close friends. Uh, immediately, I took mm -hmm. him, you know, to look at things, architecture in Thailand and other things. And then, you know, back and forth. So we friends before. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, one time I was visiting him in Osaka, where he's based, and he has a competition uh, for a museum called the Museum of Modern Art uh, in Fort Worth. And I was reading this particular book, 
uh, called Deconstructing the Kimbo, which it's, is yeah, similar, yeah. <laughs> which is such a fabulous book. I recommend everyone to read. Uh, it talks about uh, architecture and deconstruction. If mm-hmm. you recall, you know, in the 90s, it was a hype, deconstructivist architectures mm-hmm. and other things. But it was talked about why, you know, if you're going to look at an architect who's such a good deconstructing, you have to look at Louis Kahn. Mm. And this particular co- competition that Ando was doing is next to the Kimball Museum, which is considered mm. the best art museum in the world or in the country, right? So I was telling him, like, well, you need to read this book because it's, I think it's just profound how, mm. you know, analyze Khan's work and in a theory, theoretical context. So he asked, well, why don't you come and work on this competition? So I, I, I was like, I oh, okay, sure. So, yeah. uh so I then, uh, it's like, okay, and in Japan, it's very difficult for foreigners to have an apartment because people don't trust, you know, outsiders yet. So he said, oh, why don't you come and stay in our guest room next door? Mm. And so I stay for the first six months working on competitions and some other things. And at the time I was so, I was 27 years old, I was so wanting to get my hands dirty, mm. you know, after PhD. And I know that uh, with a PhD in architecture, no one wants to hire you because they think that you're a smart ass. Right, like you know, no one wants. I mean, even me. If someone has a PhD applying to my job, is like, oh my god, another smart ass. Like you know, can't really deal with that. Mm -hmm. So, so I was so wanting. So I was making models. I was doing everything because I was dedicated to the competition. So that's kind of my first baby, even though I was working under his his signature. And because I was living with them. Mm-hmm. He and his wife, and so we're meeting every day. He take, I mean, so the, the learning is really not about the work at all. The learning is about him, how he can ha- carry himself at home, in mm-hmm. public, at work, at play, right? So that eight years of intense mentoring that I almost cannot imagine how someone can get to any place without that. Like, so I'm big on mentoring in that sense. So do you do that? Do you give back in that way? Do you have I people? do, but it's different because in America, the line between work and life is very splitted. Mm-hmm. I don't entertain with my staff, right? I don't spend weekend with them. We go do things together. I try to do as much, but I sort of respect their boundaries, right? Whereas with Anto, it's almost every waking minute because you know, we live in the same, you know, next apartment. I travel together all the time. For the last five years, I translate everything he said in English. Oh. So it become a weird osmosis system. Mm-hmm. But what I learned, uh, of course, design and philosophy, but more, which is maybe more in- of interest to you, is really how success come to him, right? Yes. And how yes, let's, let's this story yes. and how the creativity, the design section, and the career kind mm-hmm. of overlap, yeah. Right, and we were talking about this a moment ago before we officially started, but the skill set that comes with the ability to talk about your work and communicate the power of a vision as an architect or an artist, in a lot of ways, Ando is a disruptor. You're a bit of a disruptor bringing all those things together and being able to communicate with whoever your end commission, the decider, how do you sell yourself? Because you have this broad range of career now where you're not just architect, you've transcended all of that. Um, how, like, what do you see as the ability to like be in the room with the client and really get your vision across? Like what is that, what does that skill set look like and how do you feel you would even begin to teach that to someone. Right. How do people buy what you're selling, mm-hmm. but you still retain your creative integrity? I think that's a very good point. But I think, first of all, architecture is its own thing, right? It's basically haute couture, mm. right? So, you know, of course, the architecture, like housings and other things, but architecture, you know, that Ando was, uh, you know, uh, practicing or as a capital A, as we call it, it's a custom design, you know, whether it's a house, it's a museum, it's mm-hmm. a courthouse or anything, right? Mm-hmm. It, you have a client, you have a specific things, and this is, it only exists one time in the world. It doesn't repeat itself, unlike, let's say, fashions or others. Mm-hmm. So w- with that, the reason why I think it's very important is that you, you touch on a very important, communication is key. Because looking at the anatomy of the uh, profession, 
you have an idea, you sell an idea to a person or a group that willing to spend a lot of money to build it, mm -hmm. right? So you don't even it's have anything to sell. You all yeah. have an idea. Yeah. So you need to sell the idea. So communications is all you have, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like, I mean, unlike artists, because artists, you finish a painting, you don't have to speak to anything. Mm -hmm. You might want to talk about the narrative and the research, but you know, the collectors come in and I love that, get it, right? Mm -hmm. Architect doesn't have that. No. You might have a sketch, you might have a drawing, but it's not the you real thing. You can't buy the idea. Right? Mm -hmm. So communication is the biggest ingredient in our profession. Mm -hmm. because, because, but then, that's why, and then the second part is, because it is an haute couture business, it's a kind of a custom craft kind of business. You're communicating to a particular person, you know, so you need to start where they are. Mm -hmm. I think... And I learned that from Anto. I learned a lot of other people too, that, you know, that what you do as your creative project and what you sell is two separate things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right? Yeah. You're very clear about what you're trying to do. You, you stay true to your own mission to how you will go in history of your trade. That is you and you alone. Yes. The client and couldn't care less about that. They Fair. might, mm -hmm. but they're not going to buy that for that mm -hmm. price, right? It's you and you alone uh, who walk that path. But if you want support for you to walk that path, your clients and your museums or your stakeholders, they need to see why is this good for them. Mm -hmm. And architects are not very good at talking about other people, mm -hmm. right? They only talk about this is why I come up with the idea. It's about my intellectual process. You know, right. I want to explore this material. I want to explore this. They're talking about them, their exactly. So it's yeah. their point of view. Yeah, it's yeah. like I want to walk this way. I want mm -hmm. to do that, mm -hmm. right? And, which is okay. Chef do that too. They talked about their process. Fashion designer talked about it too, mm -hmm. their inspiration. But that's your internal process. But it doesn't mean that it has to be diluted by the external process. But if you're smart enough. You should also kind of get that what you're cooking is actually good for other people too, right? Right. So it's mm -hmm. not like an intellectual masturbation for yourself. Yes. So I think that's a part that most people don't do, because I even hear it in my staff. You know, when they present it to the client, it was like, oh, we were in love with this idea of the compositions and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. We explored this and this and this, and I look around at the client. The client's like. So why why is why is it for, what is it for me? Got it. So, yeah. so less yeah. eyes and more use. And <laughs> but I way, think I think it's two things, right? I think you know, if you're in a relationship, you kind of know that uh, there's something for you, but it's something for the other person. And architecture is the art of relationship. Mm. And you work on so many public spaces that that is really important part of it. Yeah, because you have. I mean, you have, and there's two parts to what I want to ask you, but. For, for someone like Frank Gehry, there was his Bill Bow moment. I feel like it's the first moment when he got noticed in that international way. And then Disney Concert Hall. Yeah. What do you, do you feel like Grand Rapids was that moment for you? Because you kind of, you have become the go-to guy for anything that's design or art related. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, and we know you're very good at it, but, but how that happened? Is it just because of the result of how you worked with Ando or is it just the particular thing that you do well. Yeah, well, I think, um, I'm not sure I have a mobile bow moment yet, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm not even sure whether it could exist anymore in the world today. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, wow. you know, I think, mm -hmm. it, because at that time, you know, even though the internet was around, it was not as saturated as today, right? The impact of an event mm -hmm. is stronger than the uh, impact of an event today. Right, you know, there's just so, so much so, more of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, so, 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 so that mm -hmm. notion. But, you know, but, but I think coming back to, 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 your, to your key questions, um, absolutely. I think uh, having worked closely with Ando for eight years it was in my tailwind. Right? So I, when I moved here and started the firm in 2004 for Grand Rapids, uh, it came because the director of the museum had seen what I have done under the Ando signature and was like, okay, well, He's here now. Okay, let's give him a chance, 
right? And that was that. And we have to replace another architect. So we have a very short time to come up with a new idea and bring, at the same time keeping the schedule, keeping the budget. So it was a test for a, a small firm. We started at the time maybe four people. Wow. And, and it was uh, a, a big challenge. I remember telling my staff then, it's like, well, if you survive this, it's like loss, uh, the series. If you survive this, <laughs> it, it will stay with you. The end. <laughs> it will be your, your, your good, good lessons. Yeah. Because my, my staff at that time were just new, newly graduated, right. right? So, but they were plowing at it. You know, I was very hands on and it, it built, you know, and it, it opened 2007. And it's, it's not, you know, comparing to Bilbao, it doesn't have that kind of sculptural, you know, look at an iconic feel. It's a very classic, very, what's the right word, beautiful building, but it's not trying to to bring attention to itself. It's a very kind of accommodating rather than attracting. But is that know? also partially because it was the first LEED certified building? Was that the practicality of it part of the LEED certification? Not true, but to, to main reason, to be honest, is really because I see, as I was growing to it, you know, I think I understand the city. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I do houses or museums, weird as it is, I always think of it almost as a as a gown. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. That like, will this gown or will this costume fit the, the personality of that person? Right. The wearability of it. Yeah. And, that, you, and in the future, like, would you yeah. wear it again? Mm -hmm. That's a very yeah. interesting yeah. way to think Like, for example, it. the city of Grand Rapids are very covenous, you know, very understated, mm -hmm. you know, Dutch, right? They don't want to show wealth. They don't want to show, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very sophisticated and subtle in mm -hmm. a very kind of minimal way, right? So I feel like, yes, we want it to be attractive, but it has to be attractive in that particular character, right? So the front of the museum and everything was designed through that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the lead part also involved because we want a lot of windows. So there's a, mm -hmm. the, even, it's a, there's a lot of attraction, indoor, outdoor, so that helps. But I didn't do anything that has like a very strong, let's say, eye-catching thing uh, because I felt that it would not fit with that character of that city because I felt like, well, you know, I would not put that person in this Isemiyake deconstructed dress because mm -hmm. the dress will kill the character. Right. Right? That's so interesting, I love yeah. that. And I, I feel that, that because mm -hmm. I, I deal with that and I know that it's not the right thing to do. And mm -hmm. I think, but there are moments when like, let's say the Speed Art Museum in Lower Kentucky, right, which is more, you know, this is home of the Derby, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more flamboyant, there's mm -hmm. more, yeah. there's a sense of warmth because it's kind of more southern. So yeah. I you know, obviously push more in terms of the, the sense of the, let's say the daringness of the sculptural aspect of architectures and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm very, mm -hmm. not only sensitive, but I'm very uh, mindful about how the work fit with the the context uh, yeah it's not just the people that pay for the building but it's the city and uh, the 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 topography or whatever yeah well yeah it's, you're speaking again to the longevity of it you're always thinking about how it's going to adapt and the longevity i love that concept and how you're thinking long term and it's 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 really beautiful i, I think you're absolutely right and and it would it would be sad for someone to spend a lot of money, mm -hmm. commission an old couture gown, right? And mm -hmm. then I was like, well, that's not me, mm -hmm. right. right? It was, yeah. it was only built in your sizes, and... yeah. your, <laughs> right. your, you know, body-wise, it fit you perfectly because yeah. it was measured. But uh, personality-wise, it. Mm -hmm. it doesn't allow you to, to thrive. Yeah. That's kind of, and I see that, and, you know, um, you know, I'm sad as it is, I mean, I have to be, you know, I'm not too bad now, but, not a lot of architects think that way. You mm -hmm. know, they want to create the, you know, the theory Mugler, yes. okay, so you know, talk. dread for everyone. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so Los Angeles, LA County Museum of Art about to go undergo uh -huh. a <laughs> mass, <laughs> <help herself>. um, <laughs> you know, a mass redo, a, ma a new building mm -hmm. that's been extremely controversial. Mm -hmm. A lot of really powerful people have spoken out against it, mm -hmm. pieces about mm -hmm. it. I am a fan of Peter Zemtor's. I've had some really like incredible, I've been to Val's and it really was a wow moment for me, one of those life-changing moments. 
But I'm curious what your opinion is on the building and where it began and where it kind of ended up now and how you think it will shape Los Angeles. I think uh, Michael and Peter are on to the biggest gamble of both of their careers. And you're referring to just Michael Govan. And who, Peter Zumthor. And, and Peter Zumthor, yes. the architect, just for yes. anyone that doesn't know. Michael is a, a dear friend, close confidant in many ways. And Peter is also a dear friend and collaborator. And so I know both of them well. And I'm a supporter of the project. But the proof is in the pudding. Mm. right? I think what they're doing is they're, 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 they're doing two things. Uh, they're, they're, they're going, not only just the architecture, but the, the program, the operation. They're, they're redefining what... An, an encyclopedic museum would look and feel and function. Right, because they are saying that they, and they've lost support because of, of this, but they may not show old masters at all times. It may be more about it's a rotating, things yeah, that yeah. are of the moment and more relevant. Yeah, and they want to mix things together. And, you know, all of these are good things. You know, I think people, uh, you know, just like any kind of index system, right? You know, there's never a perfect system. You can index in, you know, winter or summer or whatever it is, you know, in colors or other things. It's just one system of indexing. But, but uh, they're very brave in, in, tr in proposing a new this system of showing art that are not supposed to be completely separate into other things. So they want to say, well, the story of art and story of, of creativity is all connected. So you can see, you know, old masters and Egyptian art and Korean art together in one room, for example, right? And the architecture allowed that to happen because it's on one floor and fluid. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, so on the model typology of museum, it's already trying to kind of pr propose a new version. On the architecture too, that, you know, of course, lifting the building up in, in one story is something that's very LA, right? I think can both you speak of to that a little bit? Yeah, I think both of them see that LA is always a line of invention, right? So we have two options. Adopting uh, the Integral Museum uh, model, which of course started in Europe and come through America to the East Coast and kind of trickle it down into LA and the rest of the country. We can be a mini Met or you know, a mini whatever, right? Or mm -hmm. do we go big and go home mm -hmm. and do something that is made in California? And they'll either be considered geniuses or it will be seen as possibly a failure. And, and, and yeah. But, but backing up a moment, um, I think, you know, I've read some things where you've said you've looked at what Frank Gehry kind of carved out for himself in Los Angeles and it drew you here mm -hmm. because there was room for innovation. Absolutely. And disruption of like what was typical. And they are doing something very atypical and it is a big risk. And we... I mean, this podcast is about talking to people who disrupt what is normal. Because if no one does, everything becomes very trite and boring and never really changes. There's no future that way. I moved from, from Osaka, right, here. I've never lived in America before. I've been coming because I was working on American projects for Ando. And at, at the time I was 34, too old for New York. <laughs> right. That's I funny. mean, I feel like I just couldn't go and work with someone else. Yeah. Right. Because I felt yeah. like Ando is my mentor and I'm ready. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know that at 34 years old, moving to New York and Manhattan, you know, not that I have to work for someone to get connections or I'm just going to have to be doing loft and, and, and boutiques all my life, mm -hmm. which is not what I want to do also because I was also already working on museums and big projects with Ando. And so mm -hmm. I was very interested in that kind of trajectory. And so when it came by LA, I feel it's it feels so open. It feels like it's a place and anything can happen, mm. right? And I think it's also one thing which is a great quality of LA is is very forgiving. Mm. That's interesting you because know? they because it lets you experiment. There is that tradition of experimentation. You mean or and, and if you memory? and if you don't <laughs> make it on your yeah. first go, mm. you know you can wait till until you can, oh, right? Yeah, you, you, there is you, a I mean, culture here. You know, yes. and and when you look at even. Some of the most revered names in Hollywood, George Clooney, yeah. for example, yes. right? He didn't get his break Latecomer. until later, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. And everyone wait table, everyone yes. did anything they could until the big break arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that the, the, the forgiving quality of LA is 
kind of underrated. I agree. Part- I think it is the land of dreamers in the best way. Yeah, you know, yeah, that we, yeah. But also, it's not the cost of living is lower, and you can be, yeah. you have the outdoors, and and things are more manageable to get through. Like you can make a little bit of money and survive a little bit longer here. Yeah. So it's a better environment. It breeds artists and creative people because it, you know until recently, like there were plenty of places to live for not so much that you can and have you could have mm-hmm. a nice you could go for a walk on the beach. Life was was better. Absolutely. And on, on the opposite side of that, which other people don't really talk too much about, but I mean, as you talk to artists, right, the creative infrastructure is insane. Mm. If you want anyone who can do like a like a aluminum work immediately, Hollywood has all of that, right? And they're mm-hmm. all freelance. Yes. All the artists are moving here, not because of the pseudo space and the light and other things, because if you want to commission anything from framing to plastic to metal to glass, you can get artisans and artists who work you know, with Hollywood. We mostly. still make things in this exactly, city. and it yeah. would uh, at a very you know? good price. The infrastructure, you know, I was talking to a, a, an artist friend who moved in Europe, and it, they just could not even even in Berlin, which is still you know mm-hmm. craft oriented. There's no such place you can get good artisan for the price and be able to get a very good process going on. It's a very rare kind of secret ingredient infrastructure that we need in architecture too yeah you know as you know i mean you can get the best painter the best uh, worker people mm-hmm. putting things together and they're all freelance because of the hollywood nature of things so mm-hmm. everything is very nimble in a sense mm-hmm. like we're not dealing with corporations and and one last thing that i want to talk about la before i shut up is like i, I that because i'm like one of the biggest la ambassador it's maybe the only city in the world that the main industry is creative. Right. We're not in a we're not a yeah. banking city. We're not a law city. Mm-hmm. We're not a Political money laundry city. city yeah. Right. We Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And no matter what you think about Hollywood, I mean, it's not just film. It's movie. It's advertisement. It's all collateral design. It's all related yeah. to that. And so we have a different mentality. We're not a nine to five hierarchical Wall Street kind of city. Mm-hmm. Well, we and and that. That is, I wanted to ask you, because I always am fascinated by what you're wearing as well, because I do think that is an expressive part of who we are, like what we're wearing. In Los Angeles, you can walk into the same restaurant very dressed up or very dressed down, and we're accepting of that. You don't have to be wearing your suit and tie, and that culture has kind of trickled down too. But you are always wearing, I mean, you you are in union halls, you <laughs> have sort of some uniforms, <laughs> but but wh- where do you draw your fashion from? I mean, do you follow fashion a lot? Do you just wear what you feel like every morning? Is it part of what you do, what you're selling? For me, it's all about ideas, right? It all down comes down to ideas and some ideas about branding and some ideas about communication. And for me, um, fashion is a big part of, of life. You know, because it's how you express yourself. It's the most fundamental way of you express yourself. And that's one thing that, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of LA in that sense because people don't dress up. Mm. You know, because, you know, in a way, it's a Hollywood culture that, you know, the, the studio head, you know, sit by, by their pool and their kind of sweatpants, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, the more you dress around, the more powerful you are because you don't have to dress up to, mm-hmm. for anyone. That's kind of a Hollywood model right. so hierarchy. It's a rebellious it's model. Exactly, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, you know, because you don't have to put up a suit and tie to anyone. So that's kind of rebel. But in the same time, it doesn't mean that you don't have to wear a suit and tie, but you have to be creative about how you express yourself. So I look, I mean, and especially... In Thailand, Japan, Asia is so fashion obsessed, right? Because it's everything. It's your shoes, it's your back, it's your what you're wearing. And it's it's and it's it's two things, right? It's it's it, whether you understand the time you're living in, and whether you understand who you are. Mm. And I think that's that's what I look at. Like you understand your time you're living in because you understand the trend, you understand social issues, you understand you know design trends or whatever, mm. and you understand who you are and how you relate to the world. So fashion function as that skin yeah. that in a way reflect who you are mm-hmm. and how you relate it to. And how you present t- yourself to the world. But yeah. I love how, you, I don't know if you meant to do this, but how you just described that is also how you described your architecture and how you talk to a client and that, that mixing of the exterior and the interior and what you're presenting to them and what you're also doing as the artist in that moment. I just, and it's also all understanding who you are, yeah. Yeah. internalizing it mm. and then externalizing it. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I know that we're 
we're wrapping up a little bit. Yes. But I do have one last question. I think we want to talk. We, we have to ask about you can, the ideas. You can edit the other we part have, out. We have, yeah. to, we have to ask you about the ideas component because you list, you know, your company the f- as the four, mm-hmm. the yeah, four the different. Shops, yeah. And I want to talk about having, I mean, just listing on your website that you have a division of your company called Ideas. Like, what is that and what does that mean? Well, um, first of all, you know, maybe around uh, five years into the office, right, or two, 2009, uh, one day I was sitting with my staff. I already like collaboration. I like multidiscipline, just like everyone. I think it's fun to do that. And I, re- I, re- I remember that, that moment uh, working with one of my staff on a, on a, on a little, small house renovation or something like that. And it was so painful for me to see that this guy is trying to solve every problem with architecture, mm. right? Oh, we're gonna have to put a wall. We're gonna have to close window because they cannot see that, right? We have to everything in his power to solve that problem out of the tool he has, which is architecture. And I was like, well, why don't you plant a tree? Wow. Right? right. If you plant a tree, the problem's gone. So right. the neighbor right. cannot see you. Yeah. You can have light. Yeah. You don't have to close it off. You can have to put wall in front of your window yeah. or whatever problem we were dealing with. And the guy looked at me and was like, but that's not our job. Yeah. Right? It's not what we do. Mm-hmm. But say, hey, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. It's a problem of the education, right? But it was so alarming to me at that point. It's like, wow, this mm-hmm. is very dangerous. Mm-hmm. That people are looking to find solution with the only tool they have. Mm-hmm. You have a hammer, you just keep hammering anything you see because that's what you're good at, right? right. So I felt immediately at that time, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is very uh, critical. So at that time, I said, like, okay, I'm going to really turn this into something of a multidiscipline. But because we are billable, so we have to think, okay, well, we can't just like, you know, have all everything on payroll and no job, right? So we start slow. We start from, okay, landscape, that's something. And I, I always love landscape. I got designer. I feel like it's such a beautiful way of looking at life, you know, mm-hmm. because landscape always have long term. Mm-hmm. Like when you, when you design a garden, the first day of the garden is the ugliest day of the garden. Mm-hmm. Right, and it grow beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Architecture, the first set of houses, is the most beautiful. <laughs> <And it goes. laughs> so, great. in some way, you know, if yeah. architects think more like landscape designer, yeah. like the longevity that we talked mm-hmm. about, and something else that allow life to kind of continue, I mm-hmm. think it would be better. So, I like the landscape designer to influence the architects mm-hmm. so because it's the way of thinking. So, it's not like because we want to get more revenue. It's more like okay, well, if you have someone sitting next to you who doesn't think like you. Yeah. Then it osmosis in, right? So it's collaborative. It's, exactly. it's encouraging collaboration. And then in, when we start every project now, everyone have a say. Even though it is an interior design project, the landscape designer will be involved too. Mm-hmm. And they will comment project. on something. Yeah, because great. a lot of time the great ideas have come from the people who are not in charge of the project. Yeah, it's true. Right, because they, like they can kind of have, a, have mm-hmm. a perspective. And uh, so then we have landscape, we have objects, which we make furniture, just like that chair over there. And that's part of our object design, which uh, we did uh, with R and company Mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. So we did a show with them and they asked us to do limited edition design. That's one, I think we have five projects and this one of the project is that rock chair there. But idea is always something that I wanted to do, right? And ideas also have to do with research. So ideas workshop uh, has two phases. So idea is also in internally it's the is the is the weave that link all the projects together because as you know when you work on project they're so vertical. Each project don't talk to one another. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot sometimes they feel like this is my baby. I'm just mm-hmm. gonna do this design, right? But you know, and for me as someone who have to go from one project to the other, it's like why you why you guys not talking to one another? There's a lot of things to learn from, you know. Right. And yeah. so the idea workshop internally is being this kind of share knowledge that come in that allow pe- everyone to kind of share their thinking and problems and solutions and bring research into it. Mm-hmm. So that's the non billable section of that. The billable section uh, uh, that income generating is the idea that idea is also working with uh, clients to deal with programming of buildings, mm-hmm. uh, which include, you know, community outreach, you know. So right. when we work on public projects, you know, museums, community centers and other things, we always propose a client not to start designing. 
we will start with, why don't we start depending on how hungry the client is between one and three months of just brainstorming, right. which, you know, for the name of outreach, right? And outreach is not only just stakeholders and handholding and lip service of, of like we hear you, but it's more like we want to know what you're thinking. And so, and we also, I think we're quite good at that. Uh, we also mix what I call local and global. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do community outreach just so that the community feel like they're listened to. And then the community, most of the time, are not as, as informed as professionals. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. don't really know what to, what, to, what to ask or what to look for. Right? But what we do is that we connect the communities with global uh, thought leaders who we pay them. For example, if we, uh, we're doing uh, an art center in East Palo Alto, which is you know in a in a mm -hmm. Bay Area, mm -hmm. very gentrifying, very complicated uh, community, and uh, the community is very active, very, very, very political. They know what they want, but what we do is that we then expose them to the thought leader of art in the world, you know, through Skype, through meeting in person. We took the kids down here to LA. We go to all the museums, to the Hammer, to ICLA. They talk to art education design professionals, so they can like. So they also get a trust that we're not trying to just like A or B, right? We're like, okay, well, we really want you to think with us. So let's hear what art in the future would look like, and then together let's think about what art can be for you. And then the, the client allowed this to happen. You know, there's money involved in this research, but allow all of us to kind of come together with, you know, what is the, the program of the project? Is it dance? Is it graphic design? Is it photography? Is it fashion? What is relevant as art and design for that community? So in a way you're defining like a mission statement for exactly, the project. Exactly, exactly. each project, yeah. And then you then define a the program. And then the design part is actually not that difficult. Mm. because it's already in the ingredients, mm -hmm. right? If you have good ingredients, you can kind of do a lot. Back to the business of it all, because I think that what is interesting, especially about architects, is that you, in success, ultimately have a company, a corporation that you've created. It has many people. You said you have 30 people in your company, right? Is that correct? Roughly 40. Yeah, 40. New York, okay. LA, half okay, and North half, LA. yes. So if you were talking to a young architect who hopes to have that kind of outcome, you know, combining the business element of it, a true company, corporation, how how would you say to go about it, or what is the magic sauce in that, that that the meeting of those two things, the creative and actually there's putting employees, them together, yeah, putting them together, yeah, right? yeah. Well, I think um, the vision and the communication piece are really like what we talked about, right? Are so yes. crucial. Mm -hmm. People love people that have vision. And the passion come through it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one thing that I know that most of my clients say about me is that we love you for your, for your passion. Mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's not sellable. It's not like I can just kind of bottle it or whatever. But they think I have a vision, even though they might not understand it, mm -hmm. because the passion I have towards what I have. Got it. Right? And I think that part is undeniable that we should have. So it's still the heart and soul. Yeah, it's always and, has to and start And it doesn't mean that you have to talk about it. I, I, I want to kind of come back to the subject, the next one, which is communications. Mm -hmm. Like I have my channel of communications, um, you know, expressive and warm because I'm from Thailand. Mm -hmm. I like to move my hands around. I like to engage, mm -hmm. right? I like to, to explain. I like to inspire. It doesn't mean that's the only way to communicate. You can communicate with seduction. Mm. A lot of people do that very well. Mm. You can communicate with um, listening. You can communicate with many things, and it depends. And I hopefully don't have only one tool in my toolbox either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not communicating to all my clients or potential clients the same way. You have to appeal to the different Exactly. Ones. And sometimes I feel like, okay, I need, I need to maybe play hard to get or a little bit of seduction <laughs> over so here because yeah. it might work. <laughs> yeah. This case, I might need to really talk about passion. Mm -hmm. This case, I might really talk about rational right, how the, the planning works. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, your product should have all of that. So the branding and communication is not floating without a product supporting. The product need to, and by you talking about it, as you know, it actually improved the product. 
and defines mm. it. Yeah. And you get into the details. Mm. Okay, last question. <laughs> when, you know, architecture, you will leave a legacy, a physical le legacy of places that you've built and worked on. So what do you hope that future architects or people see or take from your buildings? What do you want them to know and feel from you if they're walking into one of your buildings and we're all not here one day? Well, I, uh, when I was a student, I asked uh, one of the Thai uh, philosopher, poet, right? He was someone that I really admire and I was a student. I said, well, I want to become an architect. What do you advise for an architect uh, yet to be? And he's like one of those sage looking uh, person and he looked around, uh, we were in like a room, and he, he looked around and pointed to a staircase over there. And he said, well, if you can design a staircase, then when people go up on the staircase and when they arrive at the top, they, they reach enlightenment, mm. then I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is a serious spiritual trip here, right? So, but it stayed with me because it was something that I didn't expect. And what I translate in it, which come back to you to, to point, is that I want my architecture to allow people to thrive, to allow people to to you know to flourish in their own way. Mm -hmm. So I and that's only to be honest, that's part of why I don't do architecture as minimal. I mean, even though some of the work are minimal and other things, because I can see that minimalism. It's also sometimes it's controlling for life, you know. I'm, I'm I'm sorry to say that, but but you know, it's I know how to do minimal, right? Mm -hmm. But but minimal is one mode of being. A lot of people might not want to live that way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but of course, you know, yeah. it's very photogenic. It's easy to get. You know, beauty, uh, minimalism is beautiful, is because it's understandable. You know, uh, the link between knowledge and beauty is very clear. You know the backbone. You know you have beautiful wall. You have the light. You have one object, right? That's a very the clarity is beautiful. But humans' lives are mostly messy, and I think that I'm more interested in that messiness and how I can bring a sense of order to it. That it's not too controlling. It still allow things to be identifiable, but also allow life to move on. Like like a garden. That's why I'm so that's, obsessed with garden. Yeah. That is perfect, and I Actually. can't wait to tell my husband you said that. Yeah. He loves to be a minimalist, and I love to be the messy one. Yeah, and, and I think that we we kind of fascinated with that, you know, kind of quiet, solid, minimal space, right? Mm -hmm. But we also miss our mess. We miss things, mm -hmm. right? But so, and we need yeah, to use things. yeah, and yeah. we need to live we need a to live. real life. And as the moment that. I put my paper and pencil down on your very perfect minimal home, I've suddenly interrupted the vision. And I think that is often hard to live with. That's mm -hmm. true. And, yeah. and, and, and I think, and, and you, you also see that a lot of time, um, you know, minimal space is beautiful because they're so spiritual, right? They feel spiritual, but they are so devoid of every side of life, except from the sun. Right. Yeah. right, humans are not touching this. This is mm -hmm. this is beyond, and people love that because it's timeless. So again, but maybe what I'm trying to say is that I think within that mode, the communication part, which is the the latter part, is crucial, mm -hmm. because there's a way uh, for you to to be able to, to 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 get there by allowing other people to be part of that process. And I feel that you know I'm you know. At least now, I don't have any kind of ego that I want. I don't. I don't. I don't want my building to. Oh, look! That's he designed that. I don't have that kind of ego, you know. But I have my ego. My Which ego is, is I want people to feel like, oh, he's actually the one who made it happen. He's the one who allowed people to enjoy art in the museum, right? Or he mm -hmm. allowed me, or he created a space that that inspired me to love art. So in a way, like a great facilitator. Yeah, yeah, and I don't mind that. Yeah. Whether it's a matchmaker, That's or or mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what, what do you call a lady who deliver baby? Midwife. Oh, midwife. Yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like that. I felt that there's something so fulfilling for me mm -hmm. in that role, rather than like creating a. A skyscraper that looked like a dildo. It's like, well, that's me now. I'm right. gonna be pissing yeah. on are you. And you're defined by it. You've created some very strong yeah, boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. And we really appreciate you sharing your philosophy 
and your secrets yes. because I hope I have more. I know. <laughs> a lot of, of, of I'm, I'm all about sharing. Yeah, yes. because because I feel that you know the better. Uh, one of my pet peeves is architects uh, with our talent and our knowledge do not have enough impact on society. Mm. I felt that we designers in general too that we uh, are a lot of time compete with each other for the smallest piece of bones mm. that someone throw. I know that because you know when you work uh, with developers or politicians or people that have power in many ways or think they have power architects are like this little thing that's like you know because i know because i have friends who are like politicians mm -hmm. and they say oh when we have a little project we'll call you mm -hmm. like, right and it's yeah. like no we can do so much more than that what are you talking about like we should be part of policy we should be part of creating communications and things like that mm -hmm. but we don't because we were so happy with this little piece of bone that they were they were throwing at us, right? So it's not like I have a uh, political agenda to want to be an elected officer, but we can be so much more impactful and helpful for society in general if we actually kind of involve upstream. Mm -hmm. And you need you, you, I, I think what you're saying is that you need a seat at the table and at many different tables so that we can all collaborate and work together. Absolutely. And if we do that, we end up with a more harmonious result for everybody involved. Absolutely. And, and, and the you architects know, of our environment. Yes. And in America, yeah, you're right. You mm -hmm. know, people use architect for thing when 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 the genius thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. Architect of the war, architect right. of the yeah, yeah, something, right. right? So we actually do have that role. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the Renaissance time, a master architect, you know, need to not only to be a politician, you also need to be an engineer. You need to know how to build it. And it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a renaissance man in that sense. And since then, because of the division of labor, we become you know, basically a decorator of diagrams, mm -hmm. right? We have a plan that someone already determined. We have the schedule, we have the budget. And what we have within that, we just do everything we could within that parameter, right. which is not bad. But I'm just feeling that with all the education and knowledge and skills we have, we do have a bigger impact and, and role that we can play. And, you know, that for me, I I'm, I'm feel very helpless uh, with, let's say, the homeless issue. Mm. I felt like uh, instead of donating money to a homeless shelter institution, what else I can, can I do as an architect to deal with that subject? Right, what can I do? I, I tried to do I, what I could, but it, it doesn't move the needle. Right, right? Like micro I've, homes, you mean like the physical space of yeah. how we would or solve this problem? Or is the problem even more about software? God, how to use what we already have yeah. Yeah, and adjust yeah. it. Is a problem is because we don't have the mm -hmm. spaces that allow people to feel comfortable within that space. Mm -hmm. Because I also, see, working in San Francisco, I also see a lot of affordable housing made for homeless that no one's in there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So building the unit right. doesn't mean you have mean to get that. your idea team in there first, actually talk to them, uh -huh. find out what, what they yeah, want. What they, yeah, so that they want to stay and how yeah. it works for them. You're right. It's the same type of problem that you solve all in your life, but you would take it over here and solve it for that huge problem that we really can't solve. That's the reason why they all intend on Penn Mount Golf Course. Yeah. Right? Because, yeah. I mean, I would love to live there because right. you, you exactly. open your tent, you're like mm -hmm. this uplifting golf course, mm -hmm. you know. it's So so the humans too. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that they would just be in any box at any price. Right. right? They want uh, to live their life. And I think you're right that, that I think listening is is a powerful skill for a solution. Yeah. Well, oh, we've wow. enjoyed listening to everything yeah. that you have said, and we really do appreciate you taking the time and letting us into your home. Beautiful thank home. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I hope we get to do this again, maybe in a panel situation. Or yeah, that would be an amazing. Idea or over an, a dinner table would yeah. be fun yeah. as well. Yes. We can Absolutely. always do our own little now that people are started to mingle. And, yes. Yes. and thank you for these two guys. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so much. Thank you. Thank, right. you. Right. thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye.